from your local election headquarters. This is the Libertarian Debate for Governor from the Wood TV8 Studios. Welcome to this debate between the Libertarian candidates for governor, a unique event since this is the first time the Libertarian Party has qualified for the primary ballot in Michigan. We're happy to host this moderated conversation. The rules of the debate are very simple. One minute opening statements, one minute to answer questions in alternating order, two 30 second rebuttals if needed, then 60 second closing statements will go for the entire hour. With the formalities out of the way, let's introduce you now to the Libertarian candidates for governor. We welcome John Tater, a retired teacher, U.S. military veteran, and Bill Jeleno, a real estate and title executive. Gentlemen, welcome both of you to this forum. Thanks for Th being here. Thank, Thank you very here. much. As determined by a coin toss just moments ago, Mr. Tater will go first for 60 seconds with an opening statement. Sir, please go ahead. I'm tired of the uh, Republican and Democratic nonsense that's been going on over the years. We have lost our republic, and try, they're trying to push us into a democracy. We're no longer a state of law. We are a state of who's ever sitting on the bench at the time. We need to return back to the republic, which was what our government was originally established for, where the people are in charge, where the people have the sovereignty, and the government is their servant. Uh, in order to do that, I decided uh, to vote for a Democrat or Republican. We're going to get the same thing we've been getting over the years. The only way to do that is to run for office myself. That's why I've decided that I want to get involved in the political system. I will uh, do everything I can to return back to a republic. Thank you, Mr. Chilton. Yes, Rick, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and uh, address the voters. Um, I've been a longtime libertarian activist and someone who has worked diligently for many years to improve the political system and to create more voices. Um, I have a lot of criticisms of our current government as well as many of our citizens do. Um, but I'm a local businessman and I have my own ideas on how to help create small government and work cooperatively with others. Um, libertarians believe in small government and personal freedoms. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of things, but I hope folks do come to my website, which is cometogethermichigan.org. I selected that domain for a very specific reason, is that I don't think we're going to solve problems just working on our own or just trying to be libertarians. I think we're going to need to bring people into the process, and I'm going to work very hard to do that. And I look forward to the opportunity to answer these questions. Well, and that's kind of where our questions begin. When we started this process, we wanted to talk to all of the ballot qualified candidates for the primary election. And as I said, this is a unique opportunity for libertarians. When the Republicans were here, I asked them about the Trump effect and how the different factions of the Republican Party might be affected. When the Democrats were here, I asked them about the more progressive wing of the party and how that might affect their outcome. So let me start with you, sir, and ask you about this. What specifically does it mean to be a libertarian? And what does this race mean for the party? Being a libertarian means, as Bill pointed out, smaller government, a constitutional government. I must bring that in because it is the Constitution that has allowed government to operate. It is the railroad tracks by which the government functions. Uh, so I want to see a constitutional government uh, I want to see the state of Michigan follow the Constitution, as well as, of course, the federal government. But the state, we can't fix the federal government at this point. We can only fix what's going on in, in Lansing. And in order to do that, uh, I decided that I had to run for governor and uh, give it a shot that, that we can make a change. Uh, the other problem that we have is that the governor uh, and the Republicans and the Democrats presently in office are continuing to do the same thing that they've been doing over the last 150 years they've been in power. Nothing has changed. Nothing is different. In fact, Michigan has gone down uh, the slope quickly. Same question for you in 60 seconds. Sure. I, uh, I, I got involved with the Libertarian Party over 20 years ago, and I've worked very actively. I've been a two-time chairman of the party. And so this is really a, a unique opportunity. Obviously, uh, we've not qualified as a primary qualified party, and, and there really hasn't been anyone on the ballot that wasn't a Democrat or Republican in the primary since 1970. So not only is it unique to have 
a, a party qualify someone, but to have a, an actual race between two people, I think is really good for voters to be able to hear the different ideas. And uh, you know, so for me, um, this is to piggyback on the opportunity that Gary Johnson gave us. And and I think libertarians statewide, uh, particularly those of us who've been involved in leadership for a long time, uh, understand that we need to communicate our ideas effectively and work to have every opportunity we can to get those ideas out to the public. One of the issues in Michigan that has been around for a long time is the conversation about Michigan roads, and it's generally not a pleasant conversation. We know that the Republicans' uh, uh, legislature, the Republican-controlled legislature, I should say, passed a plan they say is designed to help fix the roads. Democrats say it does too little too late. If you were to become governor, what do you do to fix the roads in Michigan? Well, I think there's actually two problems that we need to address. You know, first of all, the uh, road funding formula has created a lot of fiefdoms. That's been around since 1951, and it's just been impossible to change. And that's how the money is allocated. And quite often, we're not addressing real problems. We're addressing uh, different parts of the state. You get a piece of money because you're a city or you're a county. So I think we need to look at the formula, and that's, that's the first part. The second part is where do you get the money? And uh, I've proposed a program, uh, I've looked at our prison system, and I believe that there is about 30% more people in prison in Michigan than should be. It's really about prison reform. But corrections is one of those areas where there's a substantial amount of money available where we can fix other things, not just roads, but our schools as well. And uh, if we cull off of $750 million, we could add to what we're currently spending. Roads are always a big question. What would you do? Well, number one, the uh, materials being used on the roads needs to be upgraded. We need to have better material, and we cannot be doing patchwork as they've been doing over the years. They just find a pothole, they patch it, and then expect it to go for any length of time. Those kind of problems have to be resolved by a more permanent fix. Part of the money that we have they have money. It's not that the state of Michigan is broke. The Michigan has money if they would spend it appropriately for those jobs, the pri prioritize those duties that they need to do, roads being one of them, infrastructure being the other. What other responsibilities do the state, does the state of Michigan have? Uh, I understand prison systems is one, and that the problem is that we have people in prison that shouldn't be there. So there are many ways we can attack this problem of the, of the roads and the costs, but we need to get, first of all, get together and decide how to fix those roads to make them last longer. I uh, am concerned that maybe you gentlemen found my questions. You both mentioned prisons. We're going to talk about those later uh, in this conversation. And you just mentioned infrastructure. So let's start with you on that. The other big question about infrastructure is becoming a very expensive one, and that's the question about what are you going to do about water and sewer and utility and uh, all other kinds of systems that are underground. There's one estimate that says it's a $4 billion fix. Now, that's not all the state's responsibility, but it seems clear that local governments are not going to be able to fix everything underground on their own. So what is the state's role in taking care of that underground infrastructure? The, uh, the infrastructure is a problem because this, these are things that need to be done over time and, and they need to be maintained over time. We can't expect to put in, I mean, they still have uh, lead pipe pipes and they still have, in some cases, wood pipes. Those uh, things have to be upgraded over time as everything else is. You don't buy a house and let the roof de decay itself before you get in and start fixing this. You know, you fix the roof and then you keep it from de deteriorating the rest of the house in any greater shape. So what we have to do is we have to figure out where the infrastructure is bad and then we have to start working on it on a, on a time basis. And we can, we can resolve those problems. What should the state do when it comes to the stuff underground? Well, there's a couple of things there. Um, first of all, uh, we need to look at, as we're building out our communities, to have a more sustainable model. Um, I work in the real estate industry, and you know we have areas where you know, new subdivisions are built, and we don't think a lot about just how much burden we put on. Uh, Flint, for example, you know, you're talking about shipping water through the Detroit water system, a tremendous distance, and these requires more pipes and more infrastructure. So I think we need to examine how we would 
allow development to occur, and when it does, require some responsibility. Uh, one of the models I'm really uh, fortunate, I live in, in Kent County and, and I know about the Lake Bella Vista system, um, which is privately owned and privately managed. And uh, I have a family in Indiana that also is on a private water system. And what you find is when you've got ownership, uh, they, they're much differently managed. And uh, some of our infrastructure, unfortunately, has become sort of a, a, a prize to be won. Uh, Detroit Water System is right at the top of that list. Move on to no-fault auto insurance. And insurance rates in Michigan are higher than much of the country. No-fault auto reform has been very elusive in the state legislature. They have not been able to do it. If you were governor, would you pursue changes to the current system, and would you consider doing away with the unlimited lifetime catastrophic claims fund, which is the most generous in the nation? Um, the answer to the second part of that question is no, I would not. Um, I have, uh, as part of my work, I deal with homes that have been built uh, by the insurance companies for people who've had catastrophic injuries. And I think that for the very small number of people that are involved there, that that uh, piece of that puzzle, I think, is, is not where I want to start. Uh, what I am concerned about is that when there are injuries related to uh, an auto accident, the cost of, of that repair, you know, if someone damages the knee and has to have a new knee, um, very different than in the private sector. You know, if, if, you know, you just come to it from normal wear and tear, um, the, the auto uh, insurance side of things is very, very expensive. And I think we have to reform how that expense is done and that would have a, a significant impact. The other part, of course, is the redlining that goes on in some of our communities. No auto insurance, Let's start with the catastrophic claims part. Well, that catastrophic claims part has to be reviewed, first of all. Uh, and I believe that an insurance company should be covering most of that and not the state of Michigan picking up the tab. The insurance companies uh, have written the auto insurance no-fault policy and I think the no-fault policy has to go away in Michigan and people need to be able to go out and shop for insurances nationwide if necessary because I believe as we get into a situation where we use open market and free market then the prices of insurance will come down uh, but when you're when you have a uh, mandate that they have to have a certain insurance then the insurance companies have a free ride to, to charge whatever they want and get away with it. Let's move on to another kind of insurance, and this is the question of Medicaid expansion in Michigan. The expansion of Medicaid uh, means that something like 600,000 plus people are uh, on the Healthy Michigan plan. In Washington, there's still consideration of changing the Affordable Care Act. Whether or not they can get that done, we don't know, but if it did, it could impact Medicaid expansion. And here at home in Michigan, the legislature has passed, the governor has signed new work rules for people who are on Medicaid. So the plan is for people who are able to work to do so. Is Medicaid expansion the right way to make sure low income and others who can't get insurance get coverage? And are those work rules a good idea? The, the work rules, uh, that needs to be played out a little bit. I, I have uh, issues with people that are on those, poly, on those work processes or on Medicare that can't work. Who's going to decide that, whether you can or you can't work? That's a problem that I think needs to be resolved. The other part of that is I believe that we have not enough, not enough uh, areas involving health care, such as the other types of uh, processes that we could use, the um, uh, non-prescription where people can go and, and use holistic medicines, where people can go and use uh, light therapy and, and sound therapy and all the other therapies. We need to bring all of that together and so people can find out what will work for them and what won't work for them. We're all different and to just prescribe a drug for somebody, I think this is a problem. Uh, and that's generally what the uh, standard of care is for the medical process. Medicaid expansion, good idea. And what about work rules? Well, I, I would have taken the money. I, I think over the short term, we need to look at how do we have the most healthy Michigan. We need to work on better lifestyles. And that, that's part of uh, what we need to do in terms of our education. 
Um, beyond that, I have real problems with the work rules. Um, I think they're unrealistic, as John pointed out. There are issues related to who's going to make those decisions. But for the biggest thing, a lot of the folks who are on the uh, Medicaid system, their access to employment, you know, in terms of their transportation, their distance, uh, are there jobs within proximity to where they live? Um, these are real issues, and, and I would like to see us make a real initiative to bring jobs into the inner cities. And that's really where part of the problem lies, is that there are an awful lot of people living in poverty who don't have access to the kind of job that would allow them to not be on Medicaid in the first place. Let's talk about education for a little while. You know, in a public school systems across the country, there's always a question about how are you going to fund education? What is the right level? What should the outcomes be? So on the question of education funding, do you think that the amount of funding that is done here in the state of Michigan and the formula for funding K through 12 education is adequate? And how would you propose, if you do not think so, to change that if you were governor? Wow, in a minute. Um, <laughs> one of the things that has to happen is we need to review how Proposal A and it, what its impact has been in terms of our tax structure. Uh, generally, I think education is going to go through a tremendous change. You're going to see a lot more different modalities in which people get their education. You, we have things like the Khan Academy, where people are just learning online. And I know people that have gotten their college degree without ever setting foot inside of a brick and mortar system. Um, as far as, uh, you know, our party has really worked toward private, private education. Certainly, public education covers most people, and the funding level where I would find some of the money that's needed to restore some of the services that I think are necessary, particularly counselors, uh, has to do with taking money out of what is called the strategic fund, which is another one of those areas where a lot of money is dropped, and uh, that would be part of how I would solve some of our educational funding problems. The funding of education in the state of Michigan, is it adequate? And as governor, would you change either the amount or the formula? Uh, I, I agree that the formula needs to be reviewed because uh, at, at this point, if it doesn't work, we have to fix it. Uh, the other problem is that education in general uh, has been shrinking. Uh, when I used to teach school, we had industrial arts, we had all kinds of art programs. A lot of that's gone. A lot of the industrial arts programs are gone. A lot of the hands-on skills that the kids would learn uh, are gone. And those are the things that we need in this, in this state because we don't have the kind of mechanics, try to get yourself a roofer or a plumber or whatever to your home nowadays. They're very difficult to get because they're, they're not that plentiful in number because we're not teaching that formula anymore. We're not teaching that trade anymore. So we need to open, re-expand the educational process that we have presently and bring those arts back into the school systems. Again, anticipating my next question, there are 120,000 jobs, and that may be an underestimation of how many jobs that are open right now for high-tech and high-skilled workers. But, as you point out, there aren't enough trained workers. Governor Snyder has pushed for a plan to help train future workers for such jobs, the governor's Marshall Plan that he signed into law not long ago. If you were elected governor, is that something that you would continue or expand upon, judging from your last answer? It sounds like it is a, at least a bit of a priority. Yes, it is. Uh, I believe that the we need to expand the uh, uses of, or the, techni the technical trades and the, and the trades in general, because over time, we have lost those trades, those mechanics. And uh, I, there are a lot of kids that would prefer to be doing something with their hands than sitting in the classroom writing a piece of pa on a piece of paper or trying to do some sort of college prep work. There are students that don't want to go to college, that want to get out in the field and want to produce or want to do want to work. Uh, and I saw that in the home construction class when I was teaching the home construction program. Those kids could not read, could not write, could not do math, but you give them a blueprint. You tell them that this is the goal, we're going to build this house. They were all capable of doing those trades, of, of doing those skills. They could read, they could do the plans, they could figure, and they could do math. 
If we were having this conversation 10 years ago, the question would be, where are we going to find the jobs? Now the question is, where are we going to find the people to fill these jobs? Talk about skilled trades, about how that ties into education and the governor's Marshall Plan to the degree uh, that it is only now being implemented, so we don't know what its impact will be. But it is, at, at, at first blush, it looks like the first salvo into what may uh, be this continuing conversation about skills. Well, I think one of the real problems there is we're now creating another government program. And I have a different approach. Uh, my signature plan, uh, which hopefully we'll mention, uh, is called Drop the Cap. And it has to do with restricting the amount of income that can come into the state. Um, it's above the level of spending we're currently doing. But it's an important way to say it, send a message, not just to the legislature about spending priorities, but also to the investment community. So I think a better approach in terms of how we find these jobs and how we find these workers is to make Michigan a great place for employers to be. Employers will train their own workers. And, and certainly, to some extent, I think a broad liberal arts education that should be learned in, in school may bring back some of those skills. But at the end of the day, I, I don't know that it's the state's directive to be training everyone on behalf of the uh, the business community. The, the, they should be training their own workers and a lot of companies do that now. They put their they put people through college. We're going to talk about something that is related to schools in some degree but it really expands to all of our public safety and given the shootings that we've seen, the continuing school shootings as well as other mass shootings, Orlando, Las Vegas, you can go on and on and name. The question is what do we do to keep students in schools and people that are in our public spaces safe? Is there a need in Michigan for tighter gun control or other measures to ensure public safety? Well, I believe gun ownership and self-defense is not even dependent on the Second Amendment. I believe it's a, it's a natural right and you have it, it can't be taken away, and I would veto any measure to try to change the gun laws in Michigan. Now, that having been said, I think we have a cultural issue that we need to address, and that is just safety of kids and how we build our buildings. And certainly, there may be an argument that we need to have, in, in some communities, we may need to have a better line of defense, having whether it's officers in the class, you know, in the building or, or whatever. Um, I'm concerned that uh, we talk about these things as if um, rights can then just be kind of frittered away because we've got a problem. And the fact is there's always been problems of violence and there's always been issues. I think these large recent issues have really given an excuse to um, attack what I believe is a fundamental right, and that is the right to own and, and, and bear arms. Do we as a state need to do something about guns? I think as a state we need to go back to teaching kids how to handle guns, what they're all about. I think there's a lot of, there's a mystery out there about um, ARs and other types of weapons uh, the, and, and the people are afraid of these things because they haven't used them, they haven't uh, learned anything about them. When I was in high school I was in the ROTC program and I was shooting rifles in competition, 22 in the basement of Cody High School and uh, I was one of the top ten in the shoot shooters in the city and I took it on in the military and I also was firing in the military in competition so it was a, a training method I learned about those guns you know I taught my kids those guns a lot of parents that are afraid of guns and don't want them in the house the kids don't have an understanding of it they need to be trained and how to use these things I also think that uh, arming the teachers if necessary uh, is is important. All right, I think we've got our first rebuttal request, and so let's uh, go back to you. Uh, we're talking about guns and gun control, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I don't know if I want to use the word rebuttal, but I, I want to piggyback on that. Uh, first of all, I don't think that uh, teachers want to be armed. I think that that's the the wrong way to go with this. Um, but, but above and beyond that, I think that we need to hold parents and the gun owners responsible for making sure that the guns are held safely. And so a lot of these incidents involve young people who get access to their parents' weapons. And, and so I think one of the failures of law there is holding people accountable when their children have access to the weapons when they shouldn't. All right. Are we ready to move on or do you want to? Oh, I, I would just say that the fact of the matter is that uh, what we can't teach at home with the parents that don't have a clue about the type of weapons or guns or anything out there that maybe we need to bring that back into the school systems like I had when I was going to school myself.
All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. Let's move on to our uh, next question. This could be a bumper year for ballot initiatives. We don't know for sure because it'll be a while before they all get approved. But one that we have uh, about a 99.9% .9 chance of seeing on the ballot will be the legalization of marijuana. Now, it will be something we'll be deciding in November. It's recreational marijuana, understanding that we already have uh, medical marijuana that is kind of unevenly dealt with across the state. But here's the question. Is recreational marijuana legalization a good idea and should the state tax and regulate marijuana if it is in fact legalized? I would like to see marijuana decriminalized, not necessarily legalized, because the term legalized means once it's legal they can do whatever they want. Decriminalizing means you can't be put in jail for it, but there is some control over it. Uh, I'm not in uh, against marijuana and the use of marijuana, and certainly for the medical purposes of the people that need it, because there are a lot of people that are in pain that need some form of something other than the opioids that are, are available. And that seems to be the only thing that the drug industry is pushing. But marijuana should be allowed to be used in recreational if necessary is not a problem. Uh, we have the same issue with alcohol. If somebody's driving drunk, then he's going to pay the penalty. Somebody's smoking when he's high, he or driving when he's smoking, he should pay the penalty for that. So decriminalizing is something that we really need to look at. Plus, I want to push hemp as a major crop in Michigan. I think that will help this economy in all directions. Uh, the ballot initiative on marijuana and should the state tax and regulate if it is made legal? Well, reluctantly for it. Um, I'm, I believe that marijuana, like, like uh, gun ownership, is a fundamental right. <clears throat> uh, not only should it be decriminalized, it should be legalized. It should have never been banned. Uh, the drug war generally has been a terrible idea. Um, but above and beyond that, uh, if elected governor, I would pardon anyone who's been convicted of a drug crime that did not, in concert with that crime, commit a violent act. So you've got some of these people who are you know, convicted of possession that, for me, is just a waste of public resources. We ought to have the courage to say, let's get those people into a program so that they can be productive citizens, get them out of prison. Um, but the, the marijuana issue itself, I, I think the, the ballot initiative is fundamentally flawed in two ways. Number one is the excise tax, that extra 10%. And then again, it doesn't do anything to address the fact that we've had a 40-year history of, of dunning people's uh, lives with a conviction. Next week, the Michigan Supreme Court is going to weigh in on another proposal that may or may not make it onto the ballot. And it would change the way that we as a state draw our lines for the U.S. House, for the State House, and the State Senate. It happens every 10 years, as you well know, after the census is taken. And this will be happening and would impact the census that will be taken in two years and the lines that would go into place in 2022, if my math is correctly. It would establish an independent commission and it would be handled by, instead of being handled by legislators as it is now, which is always the majority legislators, it would end up being handled by this commission. Is that something that you would support? Uh, I am supporting that initiative. Um, I don't think it's perfect either. Um, there's lots of problems with it, but it's better than what we have now. Um, it's a terribly political process that goes on every 10 years. Uh, libertarians really believe in a lot of different systems, uh, whether it be multi-member districts or proportional representation. There's lots of ways that citizens can get involved with their government that we could do a whole lot better. Uh, ha having said that, the reality of the initiative that's, that's probably going to be on the ballot is yes, I am supporting that. So it would uh, create an independent commission um, in, in some ways. I'm not exactly sure how you find pure independence. Uh, do you like that idea? That, that is a problem. I agree that uh, pure independence is a problem. But the political system that exists presently where the people in power can decide how they're going to gerrymander the district to be sure that they're in power the following election is definitely not a process, not for the American voting process. We have to be able to vote for the people that we want in office, and if the majority of the people want a particular candidate, then it shouldn't be gerrymandered in such a way that they can't get their voice heard. 
We're talking about the Supreme Court, and we know that in nation, nationally that uh, appointment of Supreme Court justices has created a lot of attention and will continue to, I suspect. Uh, in Michigan, our justices are elected. However, periodically, a vacancy comes up, and that requires the governor to appoint some. In fact, it's happened with both Governor Snyder multiple times, and I think at least once with Governor Granholm. So if you should find yourself in the position, you're governor of the state of Michigan, and there is a vacancy on the state's Supreme Court, what would you look for in an appointee uh, to serve, as you pointed out in your opening statement, someone who would follow the Constitution. What, would, what kind of traits would you look for in a judicial appointee should that opportunity arise? The very basic, as you said, at the Constitution. Do they understand the Constitution, both state and federal? Are they going to follow the state and federal constitutions and the laws of the state? A lot of judges that get on the bench, and I'm talking more bit district court and circuit court, the, it is, it's a my pal system over there, and it doesn't work. The people that go up in front of the bar, which are the uh, uh, prosecutors and the defending attorneys and the judge that's a bar, member of the bar, they don't have the same voice as if there was no uh, club involved in that system. So will that Supreme Court justice follow the Constitution? Does he know what it says? Does he, has he read it? Does he study it? This is my, this is what I would be looking at, at a, as a Supreme Court Justice. Does he understand the Republic? If you became governor of the state of Michigan, and if the opportunity arose and you were going to select uh, a justice for the court, even temporarily, what would he or she have to possess? Well, one of the things that's true is I think the the, the law is incredibly complicated and the, the you know I have great respect for attorneys and their knowledge and the work that, that they provide but I think the law has become so complicated that it does become difficult and I think we need some ordinary folks people that, that know how to be fair know how to listen have an understanding of what the Constitution our state constitution says um, but can understand that real people are affected by those things and I think that, uh, as John pointed out, the, the clubby nature of how our legal system is developed really leads to problems where the only people that know what's going on are the, are the, the priesthood that make the rules. And I'd like to change that. I'd like to see us appoint some farmers and some teachers and some uh, ordinary folks that run businesses that maybe don't have that legal training but have good judgment and can show uh, that in that capacity. I think that would be good for our state. Gentlemen, as we move along, we're going to touch on a couple of national issues, but I'm going to try to bring them back home. And this is one of those, and it's about immigration. We've heard a lot about immigration and separation of families at the border, and it's been fueling protests from both the right and the left. I mean, this has been something people are really concerned about. There have been calls from some, generally, I think, uh, on the left, uh, to abolish ICE. That's the enforcement arm of the uh, Customs and Immigration folks. In the case of undocumented or illegal individuals in the state of Michigan, if you were governor, would you cooperate with ICE? And I believe, or is it your first question over I here? Think I think so. I'm over here. Well, um, first of all, I think ICE could be abolished. We've always had some kind of an agency, and there really should be some agency that helps manage the border. That particular agency has been so foul, it's time that we just abolish it. And let's start from with fresh. The, the second thing, of course, is what brings people here? And, you know, people coming from other countries, they come here for the same reasons that our, my great-grandparents came here. Um, I think I'm the only candidate that has stood up and said that I would resist any attempt by the president, Democrat or Republican, to use our National Guard as a weapon down on the border. Um, I think that's an important principle, or to be used in foreign... There, there's a process. The Congress has to declare a national emergency or war in which case the National Guard could be used. And that's where I've kind of drawn my line is to, to what extent we're going to cooperate in this kind of mass problem. And uh, tough to talk about in a minute. I hope you'll check it out on my website. There's an extensive discussion. If we have time at the end, we may come back to this because I agree it's very difficult to get in a minute. But if you could in that 60 seconds, talk about what the relationship with ICE would be if you were the governor of state of Michigan, if any. The um, immigration issue is a federal issue. That's, the, that's one of the major jobs in the Constitution that the president is responsible for, taking care of immigration. Immigration for those people that have come in legally, 
Uh, we have no problem with those people that have come in illegally. I think we need to go on a case by case basis to find out how long they've been here, who's been here, what have they done for our country, and based on that, decide whether they need to be deported or whether they need to whether they need to apply for citizenship. But somebody that's been here for 10, 20 years and hasn't applied for citizenship, I question why they're here. Why haven't they applied for citizenship at this point? They had the opportunity and they haven't done it. So I have some big problems with that. As far as getting rid of ICE, some form of ICE, call them whatever you want, has to exist in order to maintain the police network. And I believe you would like to use I'd just your like final to say, Yeah, if I could. I, I, and it's just one of those things that, again, I, John's right, this is a federal issue. But, you know, there's a lot of people who I think just don't look at this at a human level. Uh, and I hear things like, you know, people are coming here and they're taking our jobs. And, oh, by the way, they're also taking our welfare money. It can't be both. You know, either, either these are ordinary folks who are looking for a better life. And I think we need to do everything we can do to be welcoming and to try to find a place for them in our society. And that doesn't mean in unlimited numbers. I think there's a process that we need to look at. All right. Yeah, I don't, uh, he's saying what I would probably uh, right. reiterate. This next question, in some ways, would dovetail with our conversation that we had about underground infrastructure, but it is, and, and we certainly can continue that discussion because it's worthy of more talk. But this is more specific. The Flint water crisis still not fully resolved more than four years after it started. Now, given the history of the problem and the state's involvement with that, do you think the state and state taxpayers should do more to help the city of Flint? I think the city of Flint needs to have whatever support that they can have from the state of Michigan, yes. Uh, with that said, water pollution is, it's not just Flint. It's everywhere in Michigan. And the water pollution problem has been going on for I, 30, 40 years ago. I used to sing a song, Pollution, in school because we had a water pollution problem back then. 40 years later, we're still talking about water pollution. We haven't changed or fixed the problem over that period of time. What we need to do is go after those industries, and there are a lot of them out there that are polluting the, ind that are polluting the waterways. It's not the use of us driving around or speeding around in a motorcycle or, or a skidoo or a motorboat or whatever that's causing that problem. It's big industry that's causing that problem. Big industry is being uh, left alone and not required to take care of those problems. Lead in the water pipes, is, a, is an infrastructure problem that needs to be fixed. Talking about Flint, state of Michigan has contributed and has been working, but here we're four years later and this isn't, this isn't resolved. There's still a lot of questions out there. The, the other question about how do the people of Flint ever trust government, again, is separate from this, but what should the state be doing? And the environmental issues, and I'm sure we're gonna talk yep. more about that. Um, but, but clearly, uh, in Flint, the state had a hand in causing the problem. And um, there were, in fact, there's criminal activity that's being investigated and prosecuted. Um, so I, I do think we have a hand in getting, getting back to square one. Uh, one of the things that concerns me in that conversation is the notion that, that everybody should have access to water for free. And there's, there are people who actually advocate the idea that it's a human right um, and that there's no cost involved. Um, you know, the fact is that the entire state has problems. A lot of, lots of rural areas. 49507 has more people with lead issues, which is right here in the city of Grand Rapids, uh, than the entire city of Flint. And so I, I think this is a broader issue that needs to be examined, the children's exposure to these things. And if there was ever a time to get it done, now is that time. We've got people working, we've got the resources on a per capita basis coming in, and we should make that investment to get them whole. Well, let's continue that conversation because as you both point out, Flint is far from the only example of water contaminant concerns. Locally here in Kent County, we've been hearing a lot about PFAS, a substance that was used in everything yeah. from products that we used every day to all the way down to furniture, shoes, we know all about that now. And now the CDC suggests it can be harmful in drinking water and according to a recent study, probably at much lower levels than once thought. 
Line 5 in the Straits of Mackinac is a big concern for a lot of people. They worry about contamination of the Great Lakes. We've already seen uh, uh, perhaps an anchor strike up there. People are concerned about infrastructure. We know all of these things play a role in concerns about water quality around the state. So what should the government be doing if you consider that I think both of you, and if I misspeak, please tell me, think that government has a limited scope. That's a big, big broad net to cast. So what should state government be doing? Starting with you, sir. Well, there's, there's three specific principles. Again, on my website, I have a, a, a treatise called Environment One, and I hope people read it. It's very detailed and it talks specifically about these things. Number one is we should uh, be raising the level of limited liability. So corporations that do bad things that are handling toxic substances would be subject to a greater prosecution that they fix it. The second thing is we should require a level of insurance that's commensurate with the kind of activities that they're doing. So if your name is Enbridge and you're, you're putting millions and millions and millions of gallons of oil through these pipelines, you should be required to carry enormous levels of insurance. And that will drive companies toward best practices so that they'll be doing the kinds of things that's going to limit the, the likelihood that those things are going to occur in the, in the first place. And then the third thing is I've advocated that we use the industrial facilities tax as an existing tax structure to ensure that we create a fund to go after the 7,000 toxic sites that we have in Michigan and get them cleaned up. This can be done, it's not onerous to business, and it'll help actually solve the problem. And I look forward to working with the legislature to make that happen. Big concerns about water quality and contamination, as you point out, that's been around for decades. What should the state uh, be I don't doing? really have anything to add to what he said, because that's exactly what I would be saying. Those are the same issues, so uh, I don't know what else to tell you at this point. One of the things that did come up earlier, and we were talking about legalization of marijuana, you mentioned opioids, and that is an epidemic in this country, and certainly here in Michigan, we are not immune. We have seen state, local jurisdictions that have been really inundated with this problem, and they have tried to take steps. You know, the fight has been real, even if the results haven't been. So at the federal and state level, legislatures, legislators and others, are looking for solutions. As governor, it could be a problem that's going to have to be dealt with on the state level because it, it certainly is a pervasive problem. How would you try to handle it or who would you at least uh, task with handling it? Part of the problem is the standard of care on the, on the medical side. The standard of care doesn't give the, the doctor or the, the medical practitioner any other options other than, you know, if they're, they have some sort of a uh, ailment or, or pain or whatever, they prescribe some sort of a drug that'll fix it. And a lot of those drugs are opioids. We need to remove that standard of care and come up with other options. There are other ways we can handle it. I mentioned those earlier. There's sound health. There's light health. There's uh, uh, the oxygen. Uh, I can't think of it at the moment. Uh, using oxygen therapy. There are other avenues that we could use to take care of people before we put them on. Opioid is the last resort, not the easiest method once you go into a doctor's office, prescribe him a Vicodin or something to that nature. A lot of people, a lot of families are being ripped apart by what started out as perhaps, as you say, a legal prescription turns into an addiction and can lead to many other things. How would you as governor try to approach that? Well, first and foremost, we need to use the bully pulpit to say to folks, this is not a character flaw. This is something that happens to people. It can happen to anyone. So um, I, I like to point people to uh, Michigan native Dr. Sanjay Gupta from, Ch from CNN has done a uh, tremendous and, and multi-year analysis and he actually believes that marijuana and some of its components could be part of the big solution as an alternative. As John pointed out, we need to get, move away from a pure pharmacological approach to how we solve pain problems. We need to go through a whole range of other things. Um, and, and certainly, I'm not a, a medical person, uh, I'm not an expert in that area, but I do know how to surround myself with people who understand these things. And I've had a tremendous, it's been part of the journey for me as in, in this process, is learning about people who have these kinds of problems. And, and one of the most serious for me is people being denied access to the transplant list for the federal government to get a kidney or whatever because they're THC positive. And that's just crazy.
There are a number of questions that the legislature deals with on a recurring basis. We talked about auto no fault. They deal with it, but don't necessarily come up with a solution. And for a number of sessions, uh, the state legislature has had a conversation about making government more transparent, expanding the Freedom of Information Act. The conversation has begun and it has died without any real action. And again, in this session, the conversation came up, but nothing new. Would you require or support requiring more openness, more Freedom of Information Act, more transparency for all elected officials, including uh, presumably yourself, if you were successful? Well, I think that this whole process of inquiring about people's incomes and where they get all their money uh, is, is a little ridiculous. Um, and I oppose a lot of those. Uh, now, with regard to their activities, what people are doing, um, I always go back to Harry Brown, uh, one of the great leaders in the libertarian movement, who said, you know, it isn't about getting the better gang in there. There will always be corruption. As long as there's a big pile of money, people are going to fight over those things. And so one of the things that I as a libertarian advocate is that we move to the most efficient free market-based way of getting a lot of these things accomplished. And that takes out of it the sort of using government as a, as a cherry, something we can hand out. And, and the Detroit water system is right at the top of the list of these kinds of places. It was a great job to get, and it paid three or four times what a normal position doing that job would pay. And that's what we need to move government toward being a more uh, responsive uh, um, entity overall. Should we have more access to what's going on with candidates and or elected officials? Absolutely. Uh, however, I agree with Bill about the uh, Income is not transparency. That's ridiculous. Transparency is what they're doing in office, not how they got there, but what happens once they're, in, once they're in office. I believe that we need to have a better oath of office that says if you take a bribe or if you take money or if you promise something to some corporation or somebody because you're in office, then that's going to be a felony. And uh, put the onus back on the legislature because the legislature themselves uh, are compromised because they can they get they get payoffs by corporations they get treated to uh, nice trips to London such as one of them did uh, this this kind of uh, uh, feather bedding or or, or f filling the pockets of the legislature is what's causing our problem we need to and yes FOIA is is required but not only for the politicians but for all the bureaucrats that work in Lansing. Early on in the Snyder administration, there was a pension tax that was passed. It was unpopular, particularly with people uh, who were preparing to retire, even though it was graduated. Uh, and there's been some talk uh, from some other candidates about doing away if they were elected. If you were elected governor, uh, would you repeal that pension tax? Immediately, yes. I think that the state of Michigan has plenty of money. They have shown by some of their wasteful spending and uh, I think that people that work 60, 65 years of their life to support Lansing, uh, it's time that they are retired from supporting Lansing. Yes, I, I would re repeal it immediately. Pension tax? Still for it. Here's why. It's time we treat everybody the same under the law. And the fact is, is when you look at the way that pension tax was applied, we were talking, now, should it have been brought in over time or grandfathered out to a certain distance? Absolutely. But when you look at teachers and others, um, their income is no different than anybody else's, and we shouldn't be putting anybody in special boxes. And so when they brought that in, you're really talking, treating everyone else the same. So we're taking government workers and people who were subject to that, they're now just being treated under IRS rules the same way. So um, there may be a point at which we can get rid of a lot of other taxes, and I would, I would look at this as, uh, in that box. But I, I think differentiating people based on their backgrounds is a terrible idea. Well, let's talk about just that thing. Early on in this legislative session, almost two years ago now, there was a big move to do away with the income tax in the state of Michigan. It was gradual, it was over decades, but it would have eliminated the income tax. The effort was short-lived, went nowhere. In the platform for the Libertarian Party in Michigan, it states, whereas taxation is theft, the legislature should find more voluntary means of supporting state services such as lotteries and user fees. Now, if you support that part of the platform, and if you became governor, how would you pay for government? The state's already involved in a whole bunch of lotteries, and there are already a whole bunch of user fees. So if 
you would support that idea. I'm not putting words in your mouth. But if the income tax went away, and if that's something that you like the idea of, seriously, how do you pay for government? Well, first of all, I do support the platform, and it says the taxes are theft. I believe taxes are theft. But I'm going to go a step further. Taxes are evil, but not all taxes are equally evil. And so as we're calibrating ourselves and moving away from a state that really depended on an income tax, and you have even people talking about a graduated income tax, my model is to look at New Hampshire, Texas, Florida. There, there are nine states in this union that do not have an income tax, which I think is horribly invasive. And in 1962, when we authorized um, to have an income tax, and, and so it hasn't been around forever. Michigan was a much more thriving economy before we had an income tax. And the most onerous of all is the, the city income taxes. And I believe we've got 19 or 20 jurisdictions that impose an income tax. And almost invariably, it turns into a place that business does not thrive. People move away because it doesn't make sense if you can go over the jurisdictional line. And I can point to places, you don't have to talk about big urban centers like Grand Rapids where that's true, but for tremendous additional state spending. Look at Cadillac, how all the businesses are north of the Cadillac line. Taxes and funding government if you start doing away with things like income tax. Well, income tax needs to go away. Uh, but I believe that the size of government needs to also come down. We, we have bureaucrats and, and, and departments of all different types that don't need to be there that, number one, weren't required or weren't allowed by the Constitution to begin with. They were brought on board as a uh, advisory staff at best, and they turned into, they developed into something else. So we've got these big organizations, uh, Lansing, uh, anybody that drives through Lansing, they've got all these fancy buildings and all of these uh, uh, different office spaces uh, that they didn't have years ago. So the, the wasteful spending that's going on in Lansing needs to come to an end. Um, I can return back to the uh, office, Senate office building, for example. They paid $41 million for a building that was appraised for $12 million. Who got $29 million? We don't have a lot of time left, and I want to do a little more conversation here as we talk about the platform. Uh, and this is one of the things that, again, because I think this is a historic opportunity for libertarians being on the primary ballot for the first time, and I'd like for people to better understand the party. One of those platform statements says, quote, we advocate a sunset law requiring an automatic end to most government offices, agencies, departments, laws, regulations, taxes, and expenditures within 10 years, if not reauthorized. So give me, if again, if you agree with the premise that all of these processes need to be looked at, reauthorized if necessary, but have a sunset on them every 10 years. Give me an example of an agency or a department or something <laughs> that you would just do away with in Michigan. Government. MPSC. Michigan. Um, the Public Service. Public Service Commission. Why? Because three of the members of that Public Service Commission worked for DTE at one point. Because they're not listening to the people because they're not constitutional. They don't, there's no constitutional authority for them. They're a de facto office. They, are, they have really no authority other than, and, and, then, and no matter what happens, if somebody's complaining about they don't want, for example, the smart meters are a big issue and 5G is a big issue. They don't want that on their premises. In a republic, they shouldn't have to have it. But according to MPSC, they're saying the corporation can do what they want to do. So if they want to put a smart meter on your home and you don't like it too bad, then you don't have to use their electricity. And they have shut people off. So this is a, this is a very serious concern that the MPSC doesn't do what they're supposed to be doing. And that's representing the people. If you agree with that part of the platform, and you've already said you do uh, support the platform, and you would do these sunsets, Give me an agency, a group, somebody that you would just say you're done. You bet. Well, you know, Ronald Reagan said that the nearest thing to eternal life on earth was a government program. And too often these things are not reviewed as any kind. And so I think the purpose behind that platform plank is to say that everything should be looked at periodically. We may not need that anymore. Um, at the top of my list are many of the things found within the strategic fund. Um, one of the big ones that most people know about is Pure Michigan which I've referred to as pure BS. 
Um, this is Chamber of Commerce stuff. You know, the, the, the fact that people in Traverse City or Lansing or Grand Haven or right here in Grand Rapids would like to have folks come visit, I think it's just wonderful. And as a member of a business association myself, we should be putting the money up to attract people in. It's not the responsibility of a taxpayer, particularly somebody who's struggling to put food on the table. So um, in a general sense, I agree with the, the, the pro proposal, and I think we need to take and look at each government program and just determine whether it fits in today's world. Can I make a comment? Very quickly. We're almost out of time. I'm sorry. No. Uh, Pure Michigan is just one of those. That we are the only game in town. Why are we advertising? All right. We're going to go to our closing statement. Gentlemen, I'll ask you to stay close on the clock. You have all the way through, and I appreciate it very much. First of all, again, I want to thank you both for being here. So first, Mr. Tate, if you would, 60 seconds to close. I believe in the republic. I believe in freedom. I believe in liberty for the people. I think the only way we're going to get to liberty for the people is to return back to the republic and to the founding fathers, the constitution of both the federal and state, and the laws of this land. We are not a nation of men. We are a nation of laws. And we are all bound by those laws, including those people in Lansing, both the bureaucracy as well as those elected uh, public functionaries. We're all responsible to bring the state of Michigan to a better um, organization or a better situation than we have today. We need to improve over time our state. We haven't done that or they haven't done that over the years. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jellin. Well, I think mostly the reason I got into this is I believe Michigan deserves another voice. And for me, participation in the Libertarian Party is something I've been working on for a couple decades. I stand on the shoulders of people who have worked in the party for a long time to put these ideas out into the public sphere, and I've built a lot of relationships. And so when, it, you know, particularly, you know, John has become a friend through this process, and I like him. Um, but I think when I look at the opportunity before us, if you want to make a point, I think you should vote for John. If you want to make a difference, I think you should vote for me, because I'm going to go after the Republicans and the Democrats and the system and the way it's been set up for a long time. And we're going to make them talk about some of these issues and about how they talk about phony government, phony crony capitalism, and some of the other real problems. I'm going to get out there and I'm going to fight for that, and I, I'm asking for your vote. Gentlemen, I thank you both for being here. I congratulate the Libertarian Party for qualifying for the ballot. That's a big step for any party that's not Republican or Democrat, and I think it's important to hear those voices. I appreciate your cooperation for coming in and doing this. I know your schedules are tight. And I do appreciate the fact that we've had this conversation and with all of our debates. I wish they would could have gone on for another hour or two, but they can't. One of the reasons that we have bothered to do this this year, and now every ballot qualified person for the primary running for governor in the state of Michigan has been in this studio to have this conversation, is we believe that this is a vitally important election. I, of course, believe they're all vitally important. And as your local election court headquarters, it's our job to make sure that you get all the information as easily as possible. So with the cooperation of all three parties, we've done that. Thank you for joining us. And next week, we'll be back with To the Point.